and it supports a form of scaffolding. But that word is a little bit dangerous because sometimes it feels like, oh, it's only doing scaffolding and it doesn't let you do like more custom thing, but that's really not the case. It really produces things that are very customizable in, in many ways. And what it's really good at is doing validation on your model, like setting rules for certain fields and having some UI automatically uh, available and generated to uh, enforce those rules. And it also supports powerful filtering uh, that go a little bit beyond what I showed you with the query block that had the search. And another nice thing that it provides is the same kind of uh, routing features that you have in, in MVC. It uses, they really share the same engine. Like most people think that the uh, routing engine is part of ASP.NET MVC. The reality is that it is not. It was shipped in 3.5 SP1. MVC uses the exact same, and dynamic data uses it as well. So now how does dynamic data uh, relate to this new domain data source? And the answer is that they basically work together, just like dynamic data is able to work over a link to, link to SQL data source, link data source, or entity data source, it can work with the domain data source. And what's nice is that in a sense, you get the, bo the best of both worlds. You get sort of the power and magic of dynamic data that does a lot of things automatically, yet you still have full control over your domain service where you 100% own your CRUD methods and no data operation will happen outside of that. So again, very briefly, this is nearly identical to what I showed you earlier, except earlier I had the top box being ASP.NET, now I'm saying it's dynamic data, but it really doesn't make much difference. In the old, if you go straight with uh, link to SQL or entity framework data source, it talks directly to it, while with the new model, we have this box in between, which is the domain service. Dynamic data only talks to that, and then your code in a domain service talks to uh, whatever your data layer is. So let's continue this same application that we had started, and we're not going to be using this webform.aspx anymore. And instead, we're going to tell this site to use dynamic data. So it already contains all the, the basic files of dynamic data because that's the, the project template would have contained all of that. The really only thing I need to do is go to my global.asax and register my domain service with dynamic data. And my domain service is named catalog. And that's really the only thing I need to do. Oops, sorry about that. Going back to the browser, if I go to the root of the site, it's going to show me in a dynamic data way that all the tables that it sees as being available from this domain service. So let's click on products and see what happens. Here, what we have is a view that is pretty similar to what we had with the grid view, but it's also a little bit smarter in many ways. Like it automatically produces filters for foreign keys, as well as Boolean fields, like discontinued. And one key thing I'd like you to notice is on every row, I'm able to do an edit, a delete, and I can also add items. While if I go to categories, I, I can view the details of a category, but I can't do an edit, a delete, or an insert. Can you guys tell me why that's the case? Right, right. The, the answer is that when we created our domain service, we asked it basically to generate all the CRUD methods for product, but for categories, all we have is get categories. And dynamic data recognizes that fact and only lets you do what you're allowed to do. Uh, this actually goes a little bit farther than that. So here we have um, update product method. So first I'll show you, suppose the update product method was to just disappear. So here we're able to click edit. Now I'll just remove this method temporarily and refresh the page and edit is gone, okay? Now I'll bring it back, but now we'll do something slightly different. There are cases where you do want the operation to be available, but not to everyone, only to some users. Let's say deleting a product is an operation that only some users should be able to do. What you do in here is you put a requires authentication or requires walls attribute, 
Uh, requires authentication basically means anybody who is authenticated can do it. Require roles is more specific, says so you not only have to be authenticated, but you have to be in certain roles. Uh, let's stick to the simple one for now. Both of them are based on standard ASP.NET uh, role management, so this all using existing techniques. If I, if I rebuild, if I refresh, we'll see that okay, edit is back because I uncommented the, the method, but delete is gone. Now, let's try to see what happens if I am authenticated. I have some really basic UI that I added just to be able to uh, uh, authenticate myself, so I'll register a little test account. And this is totally standard ASP.NET support that's built in to really easily create a basic user database. Takes a few seconds the first time, because it actually has to create the uh, ASP.NET MDF, which contains the, uh, the role. So now it's done. And it says, okay, welcome, David. I'm authenticated. I go to products. I can now delete. Just to show it to you again, I can log out. And I no longer can. So um, obviously, here I'm only showing you the uh, required authentication. You could do arbitrary roles and, and fairly complex stuff in there. So let's look at this page again. And here, if you look at categories and suppliers, you see the ID of the category. It is clickable, which is nice. But what would be even nicer would be to see the name of the category and the supplier in this column. And normally, dynamic data does that by default. The problem is, if we look at our domain service, the way we're getting products, this is using entity framework, and we have not told it to do a joint and include the category and the supplier. And if it was linked to SQL, it would actually do it on demand. Entity Framework doesn't do it, so we need to be explicit. And the way it's done in Entity Framework is by adding an include, and I'll say include categories. Now if I refresh, we see that category is actually showing me the category name, while suppliers is not. Uh, you're probably wondering, like, how does it pick which field to give you? Because there could be a, a number of them that could be interesting. And it's just a default heuristic, which is very easily overridable, and you could pick any field that you want, or a combination of fields. Uh, let's see. Yes, let's talk a little bit about routing. Check the clock. Yes. So routing is something that is defined in global.asax. And if you look at our URLs here. Uh, the URL looks like product, which is the table name, and list.aspx. The reason it looks like that is because the route tells it to. Now, suppose you wanted it to look different, like you may not want the extension to make it look cleaner. And for whatever reason, let's decide to switch the action and the table name in the URL. I rebuild, go back to the start page, and automatically you see that now the URL is list slash product, and this applies throughout the site. I could say if I click detail, the same thing happens. Uh, here the product ID is still being passed on the query string. Again, you could very easily, uh, by writing slightly fancier routes, uh, make that be part of the URL itself and not the query string. And I'm not going to 